This is our fifth TGI FHI of the year. I'm sorry we can't host you in Smith Warehouse here at Duke over breakfast, but I'm really delighted that people can come from near and far in the Zoom format. Over the past two years, we have had Duke colleagues from humanities, arts and interpretive social sciences fields present their scholarship. This year, in all likelihood, um, in Zoom format throughout, we have a total of 16 talks in the series, 11 still to go after this. So please, please do come back for more. Bear with us as we experiment with different formats um, and check out previous recorded talks from this year on our website, along with suggested readings by our presenters and an interview with them describing their scholarship and their teaching. I'm Ranji Khanna. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute and it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Jesus Ruiz, who is a postdoctoral fellow with us at the Franklin Humanities Institute, and specifically under the guidance of Victoria Jabo in our Digital Humanities Initiative. This year under the auspices, he, he's here this year under the auspices of the American Council of Learned Societies Emerging Voices Fellowship. Dr. Ruiz uh, received his PhD from Tulane University in Latin American Studies just in May, and he also has an MA in Caribbean Cultural Studies from SUNY Buffalo. I think it's no longer called SUNY Buffalo, actually. Uh, University of Buffalo, um, SUNY. I think that's what it's now called, something like that. Dr. Ruiz's scholarship centers on the Haitian Revolution and specifically an aspect of that re revolution less fully explored than the Francophone side. Understanding the Caribbean has long been an exercise in researching comparative colonialisms announced already um, uh, um, in Abbe Reynard's Histoire des Deux Andes um, that occur, that, uh, comparative colonialisms that occur both sequentially and side by side on the different islands. The story of the Haitian Revolution through a French lens is better known, not least because of the important text by Trotskyite C.L.R. James and the Black Jacobins, in addition to Aimé Césaire's play, Toussaint Louverture, Wordsworth's sonnet to Toussaint Louverture, etc. Alongside the most well-known revolutions of the 18th century, the industrial, the French, the American, the Haitian has been brought in to tell a somewhat distinct story not least because it was the successful slave revolt that led to the founding of a state, the Republic of Haiti. We generally understand the age of revolution as Hobsbawm characterized the after effects of the French Revolution in particular as the passage from absolutist monarchy to representative government. Dr. Ruiz, however, focuses on a different side of the story. Through thinking of the whole island and the relation of the border between the French and Spanish sides, that of a vernacular history of royalism and monarchical thought in the revolution, vernacular perhaps syncretic even, because both a Spanish history and one that drew on the historical roots of monarchical thinking from the African origins of the slaves. He has a, an article in progress on becoming l'ouverture, how a 1790 mandate allowed Toussaint to seize the role of liberator prophesized by Abbé Reynal in 1780. Abbé Guillaume Thomas Reynal was, of course, the author of Histoire des Deux Andes, as I said before, the history of the two Indies, a massive tome, sometimes credited with inciting the American Revolution and providing a lens through which to understand the history of the encyclopedia, what an old friend of mine called tropicalizing the Enlightenment. Jesus has found an apparently fake document um, which, uh, which, which predicted um, uh, um, uh, the, um, the revolution. Today, um, his talk will be about 40 minutes long, followed by questions, which you should address to me in the chat, as Sarah, um, Sarah said. Thanks very much for coming. Um, Jesus Ruiz's talk today is titled, I Burn My Nation, Black Royalists and Monarchical Thought in the Haitian Revolution. And I now invite him to speak and you all to listen. Thank you, Ranjana. Um, and thank you to everybody at FHI, um, Sarah, um, you know, Victoria, my mentor, Phil Stern, Laurent Dubois, um, everybody at Duke who's just been, you know, just so generous with their time and, and 
you know, of welcoming me with open arms. Um, Rajana, I think you, you put it much more eloquently than I could have. So I'm going to just end the presentation here and thank you everyone for coming. Um, no, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I think it's a very, you know, it's a, it's, 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 it's a really concise way to, to, to bring, um, in a lot of the issues that I'm going to be talk about, talking about today. So, um, I do, I do want to say that this talk is centered around my broader book manuscript. Um, and so you'll note that um, I use excerpts from a chapter that I recently workshopped with the history department here at Duke. Um, and so just as a fair warning, I want to let everybody know that when I go over anecdotes and our, like the juicy archival material, um, there might be sections where I can't give the full context um, as I do in the chapter. So I just want to give everyone the heads up on that. Okay. Um, okay. So just to, 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 to put it bluntly, um, the Haitian Revolution, I believe, is the most important revolution in the history of the Western Hemisphere and perhaps in the history of the world. Um, but even objective observers and experts will agree that it is, at the very least, the most radical of the three major revolutions that we're talking about here, the American and the French being the other two. Um, which ushered in, as Ranjana mentioned, the destruction of absolutist monarchies and the birth of the modern nation state. Haiti was the first state in the history of the Americas to fully abolish slavery forever. That is worth repeating, the first state in the Americas to ban slavery permanently. And it was the first black state, ruled largely by formerly enslaved people. It, sh it sent shockwaves throughout the Americas and Europe, inspiring slave revolts and conspiracies throughout the Americas, but it also instilled fear in colonial administrators where plantation slavery was the dominant system of power. So to use Seymour Drescher's words, Haiti was both unforgettable and unrepeatable. And yet, despite defeating the French, the Spanish, and British empires in their quest for self-determination and, the, and then their destruction of slavery, Haiti was, and in many ways still is viewed, as a quote, failed state, particularly to outside observers who simply think of Haiti as quote, the poorest country in the Western hemisphere, or to religious observers who believe Haiti made a pact with the devil, which was an allusion to the Bois Caiman voodoo ceremony that set off the famous August of 1791 revolts launching the revolution. In sum, the general claim that Haiti fails is that it failed to return to hyper productivity in enslaved mode. And yet, if we think of the measure of success of something that involves ordinary people who can still subsist without being enslaved, then perhaps it is a success. In this era of the so-called age of revolutions, however, the measure of success was what I view as foundational and to some degree mythical radical stories of constitutional republics like the United States and France, and subsequently um, Spanish independence movements or in uh, Latin American independence movements. In other words, the birth of the modern nation as we know it. And for the longest time, historians wanted Haiti to be something of that same significance and scale. These stories were invented in certain historical moments to serve particular political purposes. The various histories of the age of revolution were often told in very neat and teleological, imperial, or national lines. Rigid, but rousing histories. And so I want to say that the emotional history of Haiti or the founding of the nation is not my story to tell. The story that I want to tell is how when we approach the history of the Haitian Revolution through the lens of the Spanish Empire and of West and Central Africa, that is through a trans-imperial perspective, the ideas and impulses of Haiti's revolutionaries were actually more rooted in old world thought that I consider a mix between notions of liberty and authoritarianism, which were manifested in royalism. It is a story of a kingdom as the right option to defending Haitian freedom. And so I will share here the image of Emperor Jean-Jacques de Salines. When Jean Casimir talks about how the indigenous army of Haiti defeated the original conquerors and became its new conquerors, the question I ask is how do we explain the ways that Haitian revolutionaries were thinking through their own political philosophies? How is it that, to use a line from Julia Gaffield, 
that freedom can be both liberating and threatening. And through all of my research trips and archival findings, I began to note that from the Spanish angle, royalism looked more sincere. And through a secondary reading, there was also an African element, which I fully admit and realize I'm not truly qualified to talk about, but mostly through the secondary sources. So it may be distasteful to some people who have, since CLR James's groundbreaking work emphasized what was seen as revolutionary and egalitarian, in that politically, it's an inconvenient story. So here, my aim is not to rehabilitate monarchism as some defunct ideology or undermine the novelty of the revolution, but to say that I think we've misread it for various reasons. The vocabulary that I see used and the symbols displayed in the documents still lead me to think that there is something going on here that needs to be taken seriously. The royalist argument is not popular, but when I pull these things together, what I see is a conservative following of known patterns. What I'm suggesting is less appealing to a democratic and modern sensibility. And I'll say I've, I've heard more than once that when framed within the long durée, this question or this political history of royalism in the, in the Haitian revolution doesn't pan out. But I don't believe that's true if we view these processes happening within the broader exigencies of trans-imperial and an island-wide framework in which the Spanish as well as West and Central African worldviews were present. In other words, I realized that what I wanted to tell was the story of the flux of ideas and affinities in the heat of those couple of half dozen years. And it is precisely within the context of warfare and revolution where the political dialogues are happening. And given the turbulence of the time, it's very challenging to sort out. One of the challenges um, in my work is the question of subject versus citizen. To be a citizen, you have to have some sort of status. You can be the subject of a king, but be very far from being a citizen. A citizen means that you participate equally in the project and you have guaranteed rights because of that. A loyal subject to a king takes many levels. It's more about duties and belonging as opposed to rights. Status is won by good Christian behavior, military service, uh, etc. But these might also be the duties of a citizen, only that they're supposed to be distributed, distributed equally. Egalitarianism and emancipation are not the same thing. You can eliminate slavery without offering a clean path to citizenship. Indigenous people, for instance, from all over Latin America will agree that they haven't been slaves for a long time, but they also haven't been full citizens for equally as long. Ultimately, a subject might say, I've performed my duties, where are my privileges? And this is what we see in the case of the Haitian Revolution, that contingent allegiances have political consequences. Uh, as Vincent Brown once suggested to me, the contingency of allegiance may have itself been a form of political praxis. And what I see in my work is a number of mobile men of color who see possibilities and pitfalls. They're not simply opportunistic guys, but they see something for themselves. And often the successful ones don't have firm ideologies. So what I wanna do right now is dive right into what I like to call um, the juicy archival materials um, to give you a better idea as to what Haiti's revolutionaries were saying in the heat of those first years of the revolution. So a couple of months after the, the famous August of 1791 revolts, around October 25th of 1791, a free black insurgent named Juan Bautista Bongar, or Jean Baptiste Bongar, gave a rousing speech to a crowd of white colonists and people of color from Saint Domingue. With extreme hostility, Bongard, who was speaking near the French border town of Juan Amint, or Juan Amendes in the Spanish, um, was chastising white colonists and free people of color. Uh, in his first line in his speech, he referred to the white sugar planters as, quote, vile scum whom he claims knew well their rights and did not want to concede us uh, three free days out of the week as the king had promised them. Bongard continues his impassioned speech by saying, well then, I warn you, vile scum, that your time has passed. You will no longer say, captain, give this Negro 100 lashes. It is I from here on out that will give them to you. You know no God and no king and you have attracted unto thy, thy, thyself all of the ills that are now plaguing you. 
That's the end of the quote. Bongard then directs his ire at St. Domingue's free people of color, declaring, it is for you that we're here. We came to avenge the death and murder of Auger and Chavan, but if you persist to not comply, we will make you suffer the same fate as your fathers, an allusion to white French colonists. Come amongst us, my friends, you still have time, but if you follow the machinations of this vile scum, the whites, you can await the most horrible of torments. The climax of Bongard's speech comes when he again turns his attention towards the whites and he, ex and he exclaims, it has, long, it has been a long time since the National Assembly predicted what is happening to you. It is now I who tells you, we are sure of achieving our project and goals. You know that a part of the country is already ours, that we have a possession of Dondon, Port Margot, Limbe, and a large part of the plains of the north, and that shortly we will march with torch in hand to the western and southern parts. It is I who tells you, and you can believe me, there will not be one white left in the colony. And I will only add that the first white that I capture, I would like to skin him alive and cover myself with his skin. So this speech is contained in a transcript of an intelligence report from Spanish border agents to the governor of Santo Domingo. The question here is, first of all, who traveled uh, into the insurgent camp? There is a voice in the speech that acts as a chronicler of what transpired. For instance, this narrator indicated when Bongard turned to the whites and when he turned towards the people of color. This hidden chronicler also described friendly hand gestures that Bongard made towards uh, both groups, or I'm sorry, towards the, the, the free people of color. Near the end of the speech, the narrator states that, quote, making a grand courtly gesture, Bongard told us it was time to eat but that he would come later this evening with his troop to eat our supper. So we know that as early as 17, uh, September of 1791, the governor of Spanish Santo Domingo Garcia had sent troops to all parts of the border in order to ensure the security of, of the Spanish colony. Reporting to the crown in Spain details about the revolts, Garcia wrote, I have anticipated the defense of the border and all of our territory by calling the militias to arms. Garcia further stated that he was dispatching uh, Lieutenant of the King, Andres de Heredia, to the northern, northern border uh, near Dajabon, uh, as well as Joaquin Cabrera, commander of the militia, to, to the border in the south and west. So not only does the record strongly suggest that the narrator is a Spanish agent or soldier, most likely sent by Heredia into the French territory in order to gather in intelligence, but the exchange with Bongard raises other significant questions. Did this Spanish soldier and presumably his accompanying troop stay inside of the insurgent camp at Juanament or Juan Mendes, or at a different post, perhaps somewhere closer to the Spanish border town of Dajabon? If, as the report states, Bongard later went to have dinner with and provided by the Spanish, what did they talk about at this gathering? Was the dinner between the insurgent Bongard and Spanish agents an opportunity to negotiate some sort of military or diplomatic support? Scholars have shown that the Spanish authorities acted quickly out of a desire to both guard against and the looming insurrection seeping through their borders and out of what appeared to be a balancing act in maintaining neutral diplomatic relations with French Saint-Domingue. It is my belief that in its silences, Bongard's account says much about how the Spanish, through the likely unauthor unauthorized actions of border officers, aided the slave insurgents of 1791. Now, I wanna shift to the southern part of the border. In another October 1791 report by Cabrera this time, um, Cabrera captured a fascinating exchange he had with a mysterious Ethiopian general named Riquetti. Cabrera described his in-person meeting with the black insurgent to the Spanish administrators. He claimed that Riquetti had offered him sugar and coffee in exchange for gunpowder and ammunition in order to continue the war in the name of God and, uh, and, and in opposition to the white rebels who were against both majesties. Cabrera claimed to have told Riquetti he was unable to honor his request and he noted that Riquetti had 200 men under his command, many of whom were black, some mulatos or, or mixed race, but all on horseback and properly armed. Cabrera then described Riquetti's uniform. It was blue, 
but he expressed confusion at the cross stitched onto it, calling it unfamiliar. We know from eyewitness accounts that some of Saint Domingue's main insurgent leaders, such as Georges Biasu and Jean Francois, as we will see later in, in the talk, typically displayed the cross of the Order of Saint Louis, with which the Spanish were familiar. So it bears asking how a military official of Cabrera's rank and an ostent, uh, ostensibly devout Catholic who constantly thanked God in his letters would not know the origin of a cross. The number of military orders was not large and Spaniards by this time were fully familiar with all the French varieties. Was Cabrera insinuating at a new military order or dismissing what he viewed as an illegitimate appropriation? In the account, Riquetti made no secret of his Christian affinities and thus the documents strongly suggest that he was also a Catholic royalist, or at least was pretending to be one. Still, what do we make of this mysterious cross on his blue uniform? Was it an exercise in sartorial, sartorial grandiosity and symbolism? As we will see with many of the insurgent leaders presented in this study, the donning of extravagant military garb, as well as the use of military titles was common practice among the rebels. Nonetheless, what if there were alternate explanations for these other crosses? How might we analyze the ways in which insurgents explained their revolution to the Spanish and conversely, Spanish descriptions of their encounters with the insurgents? This perplexing exchange between Cabrera and Riquetti was not the only instance in which, in, in which uh, Saint Domingue's insurgents deployed re religious symbols. The insurgent leaders almost always utilized a long-lived church and king rhetoric, especially in their correspondence with the Spanish. And here, I wanna share. So this document, you can see, uh, we won't go through the full context of it, but in the top left, in the name of God, uh, this is a copy of a passport that the insurgents give to those who the, um, whom they do not harm. And it says, in the name of God, uh, uh, essentially the, the iron bar has been broken, long live the king. And then at the bottom, I, B, M, N, uh, with a J across, the J is, uh, I argue, is meant to be a, a fixing this typo. So it's meant to be J, B, M, N, uh, which stands for Je brûle ma nation, uh, which is I burn my nation. So the Spanish you can see down at the bottom, uh, translated as Yo quemo mi nación. So, this, in another intelligence report to Governor Garcia, Andres Heredia, who was stationed in the northern border, detailed the insurgents' attack on the neighboring town of Juan Amint. Apparently, the blacks had come down from St. Suzanne and integrated themselves among the free people of color. Heredia described being able to see approximately five to 600 men on horseback taking the town and coming closer and closer to the Spanish limit. Around four in the afternoon, Heredia stated that quote, four blacks on horseback had arrived near the river asking the border guards uh, for permission to deliver uh, the commander a message on behalf of their general. Heredia conceded them permission and after asking them to leave their weapons behind, the four black insurgents told him that their general just wanted him to know of their arrival in the town and that he had not come in person due to his many duties, but that he would have the honor to visit him tomorrow. Heredia then asked the insurgents for the identity of their general, but in their response, they, or presumably their scribes, left the section after Monsieur blank. They simply noted that he was a free black who had come recently from France, decorated with the cross of St. Louis given to him by his king, and that his motive was to fulfill the orders he brought from the king. The following day at around nine in the morning, Heredia was alerted by his border guards that a cavalry troop headed by the insurgent general was approaching their camp. Heredia's explicit orders were that, was that no more than an entourage of four men were allowed into the camp. The mysterious general ceded, and according to Heredia, when he began to cross with his four men, his men persuaded him against crossing over without their full troop. Instead, the black general sent Heredia a message beseeching him for two officers as a sign of peace. Heredia sent a scribe with assurances of safe passage, but the black general refused to cross, retreated, and said he had to attend mass. Heredia finished his account by stating that, quote, those who spoke with him, with the general, told me that he was a very dark colored black with two crosses on his chest, one of the order of St. Louis and the other of a cross they did not know, that he spoke very little and that he seems to be governed by those with whom he travels. 
So to better understand what Riquetti and this mysterious border town general's unknown crosses might have signified, I want to turn to art historian Cécile Fromant. Fromant's work on the early modern Kingdom of Congo helps to trace how Congolese elites engage with visual and material cultures from Europe. She argues that Congo's noble and common classes fashioned their own concepts of Christian doctrine, or what she calls Congo Christianity. Building on notions of hybridity and selective cult cultural appropriation, she contends that Congolese elites utilize narratives and visual artifacts amid conceptual spaces of correlation in order to transform and redefine them into intimately linked parts of a new system of religious thought, artistic expression, and political organization. Crosses and crucifixes offered correlates, two-edged symbols that opened important possibilities for subjects of the Congolese kingdom to ensure their status as part of the expansive network of Christendom. So within, with this framework in mind, and given the fact that St. Domingue had one of the highest influxes of slaves from the kingdom of the Congo, we may consider the possibility that the aforementioned general's unknown crosses served in part as a cross-cultural iteration of the ways in which black insurgents in Haiti fashioned their own sense of royalist ideology dependent on Christian beliefs. I don't pretend to claim that either of these men were Congolese Christians, but nonetheless propose that it is not unlikely that they reconfigured West and Central African Christian practices in order to respond to and negotiate the complex religious, military, and political practices of both the French and Spanish authorities of Hispaniola. The crosses of Santiago or the crosses of St. Louis were de, de rigueur for mounted officers, but there may have been more to the display. So echoing the confusion over the crosses of the military orders and other religious symbols, there was something else that Garcia found difficult to comprehend. The Spanish governor, along with the other Spanish officials, had a hard time imagine, imagining that the Africans and African descendants from across the border were actually competent on the field of battle. In fact, Governor Garcia finished this report with a staring comment in which he described his astonishment at the ways in which the insurgents demonstrated the foresight of success, quote, not common to the simplicity of a Negro, and instead typical of a person well prepared in the art of war, end quote. Garcia's persistent prejudice aside here, um, this comment is important because it may validate the notion that many of St. Domingue's insurgents utilized their African military experience during the revolution. So in the context of revolutionary Saint-Domingue, and if we look at the leadership of the revolution, the evidence shows that regardless of whether one was a Creole, uh, meaning born in the colony, or Congolese common fighter, the world the leaders were attempting to create was one in which their self-interests and the steeply hierarchical structures of pre-revolutionary Saint-Domingue were to be kept. In other words, the leaders were trying to move up the social hierarchy, which was rooted in a royalist or a monarchical system rather than engaging in its destruction. Insurgent leaders had to find a way to establish common cause with those who had recently arrived from the coasts of the African continent. And what better way to speak to, say, a recently arrived Congolese warrior than in a language through which his surely desired freedom depended on the continuity of a system in which a monarch and Christianity were the ultimate arbiters of justice, rights, privileges, and subjecthood itself. The notion that one could be loyal to a monarch whose kingdom offered demonstrable room to be free or to move up in the social hierarchy was likely appealing to an African, especially when faced with the, with the more foreign ideas of republicanism and liberal politics. So the notion of a tempered monarchy in continental Africa, whether it's the Congo or elsewhere, in the American context is perhaps best mirrored by Spanish monarchical rule. The two most important leaders, at least at the beginning of the insurgency, were Jean-Francois, otherwise known as Jean-Francois Papillon, and Georges Biassou. Here is Georges Biassou. Both Francois and Biassou, like other insurgents previously discussed, donned extravagant clothes and the cross of the Order of St. Louis. For instance, for Jean-Francois, the, quote, scarlet tunic was not just a flamboyant item of clothing, but l'habit du roi, which is uh, sort of translates to the, the habit or uh, 
uh, of the king, the likeness of the king. David Gagas states that the, insurgents, uh, that the insurgent companies all had a chaplain who was instructed to end public prayers with three shouts of vive le roi, or long live the king, and each service with God save the king. As for Biasu, it is likely that the death of Francis Louis XVI had an impact on him, as he apparently wept after hearing the news of uh, the French king's beheading. Despite the warning that such emotion from Biasu may have, uh, may have been nothing more than a, a rhetoric, as Jane Landers notes, um, Landers does wonder if Biasu seemingly, uh, if his seemingly personal sense of connection was kindled by seeing the six foot high painting of Louis XVI that graced the government hall in the former Jesuit headquarters, just opposite the painting of Christ. So she's, uh, it may have looked, or something like this, similar imagery. And this is, of course, uh, Carlos IV of Spain and Jesus Christ. Marcela Echeverri's work on Indian and slave royalists demonstrates similar processes. Even though Echeverri's research is rooted in the Pacific region and the Andes of Southern Colombia, I, found her, I find her work useful in understanding the motivations of St. Domingue's insurgent leaders. For instance, Echeverri explains that the notion of reciprocity and pact between a king and his vassals has been instrumental in challenging the more rigid definitions of colonial power that see it stemming only from the top down and of colonialism as a mere exercise of domination through force, end quote. Echeverri's work illustrates that caciques are drawing their power and legitimacy from notions of blood and kinship, and kinship which are rooted in a sense of history. Then what might be the legitimating force that the royalist black auxiliaries, uh, auxiliaries of Spain, as they're called, are drawing from. So I present another uh, letter. Around February of 1793, a letter representing Charles IV or Carlos IV stated that the king desires to seek the opportune mediums in order to win and attract to our cause uh, the brigands, which is a, a, a term for the black insurgents, be they blacks, mulattoes, or any royalists unhappy with the new government introduced by the French nation. Rich descriptions uh, by Matias de Armona, a career soldier for Spain who was tasked with uh, traversing the extensive chain of mountains uh, to the west of Santo Domingo and communicating with Colonel Cabrera in order to make the necessary preparations for the defense of the island uh, are important here. Uh, some weeks after disembarking uh, around July of 1793 near Azua in the southern coast, Armona relayed his first impressions of the pomp and extravagance with which black royalist leaders like Biasu and Jean-Francois presented themselves. Armona did not hide the fact that he was annoyed by the leaders, uh, by their self-aggrandizing ways, and in a letter to the governor of, of Santo Domingo, around August of, of 93, 1793, he wrote that one of the leaders who had called himself Viasu, Generalissimo of His Majesty's Arms, had captains, sergeants, majors, colonels, brigadiers, marshals, generals, admirals, and crossed knights. Apparently, Viasu's shield, or his coat of arms, was of a tree of liberty with a crown on top, sustained by two naked black bodies. Around August 20th of 1793, Armona wrote this about Biasu, quote, he has elevated himself as a monarch. Jean-Francois is a subordinate of his and is named his admiral. He maintains a harem, gets drunk, and cuts off heads like the emperor of Morocco. Biasu dominates the mountain ranges through which the dividing line between the Spanish and French fronts passes. And the Maniel, which is a uh, an allusion to, to the maroon colonies uh, in the mountains, uh, will not stop joining him since they are all one and they proceed towards the same cause. My lack of sleep is due as much to these so-called allies as to our enemies, end quote. 10 days later, around August 30th of 1793, Armona added the following in his correspondence with Garcia, quote, this man, Viasu, who is about 40 years old, has created a state or military monarchy with all of the duties, 
crosses, and honors. He has a corp, uh, corpse guards that is supplied by the enemy colony and from our own royal treasury. With a war council, he presides over and judges oral trials. None of them know how to read or write, but they have lower class whites as secretaries. Everything is an imitation of the French, mixed with the ferocity they brought from Africa. It is the same with their religion. Last Sunday, they rang the bell three times for high mass in Dondon, and because there was no priest, one of them dressed, dressed up as one and began to give mass." End quote. In another letter, Armona stated that Biasu thought that Jean-Francois was dangerous and his subordinate, to which Armona, in parentheses, tells Garcia that he views them both as two monarchs. In the same correspondence, Armona mentioned that Biasu had about 16,000 soldiers, while Jean-Francois had about 20,000. And echoing his earlier claims of despotism, he told Garcia that Biasu ruled as they do in Morocco, while Jean-Francois mimicked the customs used in Algeria. Armona pleaded with the government at Santo Domingo to please undo the knot, meaning, you know, let's, let's stop uh, allying with these uh, insurgents. The very fact that Armona was unfamiliar with the situation on the island is in itself revealing of the ways in which Hispaniola's colonial border was more porous than Spanish authorities would have us believe. Put differently, what Armona saw as a lack of initiative by uh, the, the soldiers deployed by the Spanish colony was likely due to the fact that the Spanish had already been in the months following the August 1791 revolts, negotiating, meeting with, and aiding the black royalist revolutionaries of Saint-Domingue. These connections may have taken place out of mutual necessity or opportunism, but royalism was the political program that allowed them to happen. Okay, so that, that is a, a really quick run through of the archival, um, some of the archival sources that I use in one of my chapters um, and, you know, I, I'll say that one of the things that I, I really want to put kind of forward here is that Haitian revolutionaries were falling back on a more conservative sensibility, a language that they knew was understood. Um, and, you know, more generally, I think in this era um, of the age of revolutions, but also when we look at slave revolts in the Caribbean, um, people fell back into known categories and symbols, or maybe they fell back uh, onto radical variations uh, of something that, it, that was known in order to soothe the transition to something different. And to some, this, this may be a parody, um, but to me, this was the logical way to go. It was not merely or simply a cynical takeover from self-serving leaders, and perhaps we do need to think about how the rights of man and citizen were not the natural response and that it was not appealing to throw God out the door. And as we saw um, here, I'll bring this one back up. God is again um, at the very top of this uh, supposed passport that was being passed around. Uh, one of the one of the other challenges that I just want to share of this work is that is this question of royalism and loyalty. What first of first of all, you know, in trying to tell counter histories of African and African descendants in the Americas, right? We, you know, we 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 tend to try and and counter Eurocentric histories or Eurocentric views. So. I'm fully aware that royalism as a term um, is, is very loaded with Eurocentricity and, and, uh, and then potentially even reifies some of the very things that I'm trying to fight against in this project. But I'll say this, when we talk about royalism and loyalty, um, the crucial thing for me is that you can be a monarchist and not be loyal to another monarch, right? So um, in this case, the Spanish may have been a better alternative because they were a known evil. Um, for Haiti's revolutionaries, what they saw with the Spanish was likely preferable to what they had with the French. Um, total independence, as we saw with Toussaint Louverture, was, was hard to imagine. And so if you remove a king, the slave system could collapse. 
And so this is where it comes back uh, to this notion of natural hierarchy. Um, loyalism, on the other hand, then is not necessarily an ideology, but a declaration. So the injection of Republican radicalism uh, and emancipation changes the whole program. Uh, regicide is no longer metaphorical, right? And so once Republican France makes the offer uh, for emancipation, that's the point of no return. But then you're posed with the question of um, how is the place going to work? What will the place do? And as we saw, um, the very first head of state, Dessalines, um, proclaims himself emperor. And so the, the age of revolutions, and, and I'll close here, um, touched off violent independent, independence movements throughout the Spanish Americas. And yet it is forgotten uh, that Simón Bolívar, one of the most, most well-known of South American independence fighters, drew inspiration from Haiti, which adopted empire and monarchy rather than revolutionary France. And so by viewing royalism as a malleable political ethos, one that would maintain its appeal when set against a more rigid and ultimately a more alien republicanism, my work shows that monarchical thought was one of the primary modes of political engagement in the Haitian Revolution. African and African descendants on the island were therefore able to, to fashion this composite understanding of rights and freedoms. And they drew from this complex, complex toolkit to contest and elaborate new notions of enlightenment and of nationalism. And so this is, this is the story that, that I think, you know, we, we need to tell um, in the history of the Haitian, with, with the Haitian revolution. And again, I, I think it's a, it's a story that, that digs deeper into, um, you know, the political projects with which African and African descendants and the Americas, um, you know, were engaging in well before uh, the onset of, you know, uh, Enlightenment thinkers in Europe and, and, um, and then, of course, the French Revolution. So um, I will finish with that. Thank you all very much for listening. And yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesus. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, um, please send uh, your questions to me in the chat. We already have quite a few coming in here. Um, uh, Victoria Jabo um, wants to ask you um, uh, about how you started out with allusions to push back to this scholarship because it interrupts other kinds of narratives about Haitian histories. Are there other contemporaneous analogues um, uh, to monarchical thought to explore alongside here? You mentioned Colombia, for example. So I think that she- Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think for sure. Um, we, see, we see in the Andes, for instance, and this is even before um, the Haitian Revolution, um, in the case of, for instance, the, the Andean rebellions of Tupac Amaru, uh, Tupac Katari, um, we see very similar processes happening there. Now, it's, you know, I, I don't make the claim in my work that Haitian, uh, you know, Haitian revolutionaries perhaps had knowledge of these, of these other revolutionary movements happening in the Andes, uh, but we do see this role of sort of intermediaries um, in, in the Andes who were, you know, um, who had relatively privileged positions in, in colonial society and in, in places like, you know, what is now Peru and, and Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, and so we do see how for them, uh, it, it, was, it was one of the really interesting things of what was happening in the Andes was that um, they drew upon also uh, millenarian ideals. And so it was, it was very much this sort of, um, you know, almost a messianic uh, figure. Uh, and so a lot of these caciques and intermediary figures um, in colonial society, they're really, you know, to them it was, it was about reforming the, the, the monarchical system there, the colonial system in place. It wasn't necessarily about, you know, doing away with the king uh, or doing away with that system. And, and of course, they had a stake in it, 
uh, and you know they 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 wanted to uphold the very system that had you know put them in in their relatively privileged positions. Um, outside of that, I mean, you know, I I, I always think of the example. Uh, in Mexico and Brazil as well, you know, following uh, subsequent to the Haitian Revolution, we see Agustin de Iturbide, who who also, you know, is is essentially uh, an emperor in Mexico. And then, of course, with the Brazilian case, we see the the case of uh, we we see how the two sons of the Portuguese king rule up until what is it, 1880 in the 1889 or something like that, right? And, and this is a legitimate monarchy, legitimate, uh, you know. Uh, monarchy there in Brazil. So it's, it's, it's a long, there's a long political history that I think in, in some ways, you know, like Professor John French here at Duke reminded me the other day, it's why are we shying away from these political histories that are inconvenient, right? And they're inconvenient because they don't, again, they don't fit neatly into the story of the nation as we are, as we are, you know, as we're used to, or in, in some ways were, you know, for many years trained to think in these, along these imperial lines. So f absolutely, there's, there's examples all throughout the Spanish Americas. Um, now, in, in terms of the, the Anglo uh, phone, um, uh, you know, for instance, the case of the US, um, that's a little trickier to pinpoint, uh, but we do know that there are slave loyalists. And, and, and to be quite honest, I, you know, I, I delve, into these topics very briefly in the in the book manuscript, but I don't really flesh it out as much. Uh, but we do know that I I want to say South Carolina, you know, the British are offering uh, enslaved people uh, freedom to fight for the British against you know against the the uh, soon to be American colonists, and so we do see that. We see I think there's something like twenty thousand enslaved people in in the U.S. South who take up arms as loyalists of the British. And so it's, 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 it's certainly a phenomenon that's happening. And I think, you know, uh, Mar Marcela Echeverri's work to me really uh, is, is in many ways foundational to kind of moving forward here, you know, with these thoughts of popular royalism. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jesus. Um, there's a question from Raina Henderson. Uh, do you think that part of the inclination to monarchy is also based on understandably mistrust of French Republicans and thus Republicanism with it, as Haitian insurgents see how the French Republicans are positioning themselves against them, regardless of the rhetoric of rights? Additionally, perhaps the monarchy afforded a security or familiarity that the Republicans couldn't or refuse to match or improve upon. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, it, you know, this, this reminds me of one of, one of the other issues that, that I kind of go into in the, in the project is, is also the question of class and, and race, right? And so what we see in Saint-Domingue is, is we see what, you know, in, in colonial terms, we're, we're called the petit blanc, the small whites, um, essentially meaning the, the, the kind of lower rung of, of, of the class hierarchy in, in, in regards with the white population, um, we see them becoming emboldened by the language of the French Revolution. They, they create these, these uh, committees and these uh, assemblies uh, in, in all throughout the colony where they're utilizing that language of the French Revolution to try and, and you know, I think carve uh, a better place for themselves in the colony, right? Because they're used to working on the docks or working as craftsmen or artisans, right? They don't, they don't necessarily own sugar plantations or coffee plantations or indigo plantations. And so interestingly enough, you do have this massive population of free men of color, free people of color, like Vincent Auger and uh, Jean-Baptiste Chavan, uh, who actually make part of one of my other chapters, who are more wealthy and, and have much more mobility than some of these poor white uh, members of colonial society. And so, yes, on the one hand, it's, it, you, you, we do see a lot of that. And, and you know, I think as a reaction, um, a lot of the black insurgents, you know, they, they, they see what is happening uh, with these radical white factions and they, they take a sort of, an opposing role, right? And, and specifically the leadership. The, the leadership, again, like they, they have these positions that they've 
carved for themselves within the plantation society. So for instance, Louverture and Biasu, these guys, they, they, you know, some records suggest that, well, with Louverture, we know that he had already been free. Uh, they had a lot of mobility within the plantation. There were uh, coach drivers, uh, you know, they would travel from plantation to plantation, presumably, you know, attending Sunday markets in the, in the, in the northern port town. So absolutely, there, there is a sense that the French Republican ideology that is absolutely, in, you know, injecting or, or infiltrating the colony is something that is, is, is going to run against the very uh, place that some of these intermediaries or these leaders of the revolts have, have carved out for themselves. And so, you know, what better language to, to convince, as I alluded to in the presentation, you know, a, a Congolese uh, fighter who arrived 10 years before, who had a military experience, extensive military experience than to say, hey, look, we're gonna uphold this monarchy. It does, you know, here we're talking about, well, they killed the French king, we'll fight for the Spanish king, but broadly let's fight for a monarchy for a kingdom right and so um absolutely that that plays a, a big role thanks thanks Jesus. there's a um a, a question from deborah jensen who first of all thanks you for a very provocative and fascinating project Thank um, you. she wants uh um to ask you about how you're characterizing the depiction of desaline as a represent representation rather than as a racist caricature how do you account for racism in accounts of imitative practices by the revolutionaries? Uh, yeah, Dessalines is, um, you know, I, I think for those of you who might not be as familiar as, as Professor Jensen um, with, with this history, Dessalines is, is in many ways, first of all, he's the first head of state um, of independent Haiti, but but he also, in many ways, is regarded as, as this, um, let me back up. If, if we think about the negative effects in, in, of, of the history of the, of the Haitian Revolution in the wider Americas, what, what comes up is, again, as Professor Jensen alluded to, racist uh, histories, and you know more than than silencing you know the history of the revolution, we see these racist tropes that immediately paint the revolutionaries as these you know black savages who are murdering innocent uh, whites and women and children. Um, and so that's certainly something that that you know I think the there is there's still a, a kind of a colonialist legacy there that is that is left. And I think. Recently, Marlena Dow uh, had, you know, wrote a piece about the visual uh, history of, of these representations of, you know, Dessalines and then later Henri Christophe's kingdom as these, these you know, as, as savage and brutal and violent uh, terror that they waged on, on the white population. And so in, in some ways, Dessalines represents this, this, you know, more radicalized figure than say a more diplomatic Louverture who was willing to negotiate with the French and, and the British and, and so on. But I think I, to, to try and better um, get to, to Professor Jensen's question is, for me, Dessalines, you know, he, he invokes a lot of this, uh, he, first of all, he invokes this, the indigeneity of, of the island, right? They, they name, uh, IT, uh, they named the, the, the independent state IT, which is Taino, um, which is an indigenous term. And, and not only that, but the army is, is called the indigenous army. And so he's certainly invoking this sort of hemispheric sense or almost a, an American in the hemispheric sense, uh, kind of, you know, tradition. And again, I, I have found documents talking about uh, runaway uh, indigenous insurgents or Native American insurgents in places like um, Guyana from, from the AGI, but I, I'm not, you know, I, I, it's, it's something that I, I'm, I haven't quite made the claim yet that, that indeed, you know, St. Domingue's insurgents knew about what was happening, for instance, in, in the Andes uh, with, the, with the Native American rebellions. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering Professor Jensen's question, but I think for me, Dessalines is, is, is 
you know, one of the things that one of my professors at Tulane told me was, you know, I start at the border with my project is I zoom in on the border. Um, and, and that's where I kind of set the stage for telling this story. But what one of my professors said is, why don't you start with the image of Dessalines or the image of Christophe crowned uh, as the first king or Dessalines as the first emperor? Start with that and then, you know, uh, tell the story uh, with that image uh, in mind. So I think it's, it is important to kind of foreground that image because, again, some of the criticism that I've received is that in the long durée, for instance, of the French Revolution, or broadly, you know, the history of independence movements, that the royalist uh, argument doesn't hold weight. And so that's, that's to me, I, I, think, I think one of the things that really helps me look at it through this lens is my training, right? I, I, I come at it from a, a deeply interdisciplinary, but also a, a transnational or transimperial in this sense perspective where I'm, I'm looking at it from the side of, of the Spanish, right? And, and, I get, and, I, and I try to also, you know, engage, you know, Thornton and Mobley and other historians who have talked uh, so eloquently about the African element in the revolution. Uh, and so that's something that I'll definitely need to do more work on. But Desalines, is, I, I think it's, we need to put him and Christophe sort of at the forefront of, of, of this story um, and then work from there. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Maybe I could just um, just sort of uh, follow up on Deborah's question a little bit, um, because I think in some ways behind behind what what she is asking and also um, behind um, what what uh, what was implied in 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 your um, in your presentation now is is really a sort of a question about the function of the image. Right. Um, and the function of the image in um, in uh, um, in revolutionary times. Right. Um, because it and, and you you mentioned um, you mentioned Cecile Fromont's work. Right. Um, uh, where I think that there is there is um, some emphasis on the question of performance and the performativity of, of, of images. Um, and you talked about the kind of the, the, the self-conscious modeling of the of military garb or um, or um, or uh, um, or clearly the sort of the performance of, of, of monarchy that is um, is there in um, in clothing or in um, or indeed in, in the use of the cross, um, uh, which is, you know, it's very interesting to sort of think about these kinds of questions of symbolism, as it were, religious symbolism in, in the context of French republicanism as it then sort of develops um, as in, in terms of sort of anti, anti uh, being against the, 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 the donning of religious, religious symbols, as it were. Um, I'm wondering if you could um, if you could just say a little bit about how you understand what work images are doing at the time, and what and also as a kind of corollary to that, what in, what work do images do for you in your project? You know, I it's 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 a great question because the images, if I'm being completely honest. Um, at first glance, I, I, it, I wasn't using them. And, and I realized that indeed that, it, it, that I needed to, right? And so uh, it, uh, going back to this, this issue that, you know, one of my professors poses to putting them in the forefront, I was more trying to figure out whether these Spanish accounts um, on the border and whether it was on the Spanish side or in the French side, um, how, you know, how, how trustworthy they were in a way. And, and, and what I wanted to first figure out is, is and, and again, I think I fell, I think I also fell into this sort of very, you know, um, this, this very black and white uh, view of the revolution. Right. I, I, in reading the Spanish sources, 
Um, I also, I got the sense that, you know, maybe that w- it, this was a self-serving uh, move by the part of the insurgents, not only to dress themselves in such a way, and not only to use the symbolism, right, and that are so entrenched in this kind of uh, uh, monarchical world, uh, but the language that they were using. Uh, but I think ultimately what really, um, the question of performance and performativity, um, I think for me it, it shifted um, when thinking about uh, the broader kind of the broader history of authoritarianism and the broader history of, of, of uh, to be frank, colonial thought in, in the history of the Americas, right? And so, uh, you know, as we are all trained, we know that the, the creation of the nation state did not do away with the institutions. We know that it did not do away with the, the fundamental kind of undergirdings of colonial society. It simply, you know, uh, created a, a new, uh, well, I, I won't go into all of that, but, um, you know, I think here, of, for instance, uh, the example of Biasu and Jean-Francois and, and Jane Lander's work is so important in that sense because they never wavered. They stayed loyal to the king until the very end, even though they were exiled. Uh, Jean-Francois ends up in, in Cadiz, I want to say, uh, and Biasu ends up in Spanish Florida, and up until his burial, I mean, he, he's given this extravagant military burial in Spanish Florida, and he's, you know, they, he's t- titled uh, el, the Caudillo of San Domingue or the Caudillo, something to that effect. So I think there is, I think there is a necessity here to emphasize performance insofar as, as staying true to, to, or insofar as, as questioning these records, right? And not taking them uh, at face value. Uh, but at the same time, I, I do think that that, that that performance is important because it's, it, it really, it, it's loud, right? And, and Laurent uh, Dubois, you know, cautioned, cautions us to, to be wary of very loud sources that, that we come across. Uh, but at the same time, I do think, at least with these two uh, leaders, that it, the performance continues up until their very death. Right. And so then it, can we still call that a performance if they're literally still in their final breaths talking about being loyal to a king? And we see this in the case of Cuba. You know, I think of, of David Sartorius's work and, and, and how loyalty uh, to the crown, to the Spanish crown, uh, was deeply uh, embedded in African and African descendants kind of notions of, of, of this of belonging, of or, or a, a, a nascent citizenship, you know, that, that, we're start, that, that we start to see. So um, I, I do think that the images are doing work, but I think that deeper than that, um, we, you know, the, 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 the written record is there. I mean, the, the evidence is, it, to me, it's, 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 it's pretty, it's, it's strong, you know, when we look at it from the Spanish perspective. And the Spanish themselves were confused. Many of them were, you know, that a lot of these commanders, you know, Armona and other commanders, they, they didn't know what to make of this. You know, they, they, they perhaps they thought it was sort of a parody, but then they saw that, oh, you know, they're, they're truly going to fight for us and for our king. And they even make mention that, you know, that, that the Spanish and French monarchs are part of the Bourbon dynasty. And so, you know, there is, there is also a confusion by the Spanish. And I think that to me is also very revealing. Um, so. Thank you. Thanks. Um, there's a, a, a question from um, Farin Yero. Um, thanks you for your talk. Um, and uh, the question is, I'm curious to know if in your work, you're also looking at how royalism as it is imagined by Haitian insurgents circulates amongst other enslaved groups. So for instance, figures like Jose Aponte and his picture book of Ethiopian kings and queens? If so, what do you make of it? Yes, this is such a, thank you, Farin. This is, this, it's such an important example. And Ferrer's, Ada Ferrer's work has been, you know, so influential uh, in mine. And um, I will say that, you know, images 
I, I can't speak so much to whether or not there are images that are floating around, I, whether it's pre-revolutionary or right around the moment when uh, everything starts to explode in St. Domingue. Um, but what I can say is that, for instance, that passport that I presented, um, we, see, we see a lot of this, type of, and, and some scholars argue that these are you know, forgeries uh, or that they're created in, in, for this very effect, right, that, that Farhan is talking about. Um, so there is a sense that the insurgent leadership, uh, whether it's people like Riquetti or Bongard or, you know, the more main leaders like Biasu and, and Francois, there is a sense that they are not only um, establishing this rhetoric through speeches or through, you know, communiques and, and different ways, but, but that there is a, a written trail, whether it's in the form of mandates as we as the Toussaint uh, Louverture mandate, which we now know was a forgery uh, uh, functions or whether it's something like a passport. And so the Spanish are inter, uh, intercepting these a lot of these records and they're trying to make sense of them. And they're and, and sometimes they say, well, this is this is odd. I, I don't recognize this name. I don't recognize this name. I'm familiar with the colonial government at Cap Francaise and in, in, in the northern part of Saint Domingue, and and so, you know, it, there is a sense that perhaps they're forgeries, but I think that one of the really important aspects that that speaks to is the the question of rumors, and and again, and this is why Ada Ferrer's work is so important, right? Because the question of rumor or conspiracy, in and of itself, helps to foment you know, the, the, the larger slave masses. And it helps leaders, you know, uh, more than just utilizing the language that perhaps they, they understand from the Congo or, you know, other imperial uh, posts, that, that the, the, the fact that perhaps the king has granted them three free days out of the week off of the plantation, like this is one of the most widely understood rumors in, in the early years of the revolution. And so these, uh, yes, documentation is being passed around. I, I, can't, I can't say to what degree that, that really, you know, in, uh, uh, pushes the, the, the revolt forward, but there, that definitely is there. And also, the, I think that is also intimately intertwined with the question of rumor and, and conspiracy. And so when you, when, when, and Malik Gakem's work talks a little bit about this in the sense that he takes more of a kind of a legal history uh, approach to it. And he talks about how, you know, certain uh, judicial structures within the, the Code Noir uh, in, in, in some ways allowed, uh, you know, slaves to, to, to get some sort of uh, sense that the king was their defender, right? And so, but, but, but the more pointed rumor is always the three free days out of the week that the king was going to, you know, defend them from these despotic colonists who were brutal, brutalizing them in the plantations. Uh, so, yeah, the, it, there, there, is, there is both writing, uh, but also spoken, you know, rumors. Thank you, thanks. There's a, a question from Holly Devon. How would you say that your work on royalism relates to the work of John Henry Gonzalez, who positions the plantation economy which he sees Christophe and Dessaline inheriting from France against the African maroon culture and economy, which explicitly rejected authoritarianism in favor of autonomous cultural and agricultural production. Hi, Holly, thank you. Um, that, that is one of the, not only one of the conundrums that I think this work, um, that, that I think this, that, that I'm going to grapple with, with this work. But I think, I think it speaks to a broader uh, and larger problem in the history of revolutions and in the history of social movements for that matter is that oftentimes what, what political projects or what political philosophies the leaders of a revolutionary movement are talking through and are trying to, you know, establish or utilize or deploy is often more often than not not the same uh questions or the same approaches that the masses from below 
so to speak, are deploying themselves, right? And so I, I, do, I, do, have, um, I do have a chapter where I talk about uh, cimarronaje or maroonage in, in, in the years uh, preceding and, and kind of during the early years of the revolution, um, where I look at the maroon communities. And here I, I, I sort of, I look at, for instance, Chaz Yingling's work, uh, who looks at multiple geographies that maroon communities are creating that are outside of the state. Right. And, and right. They're still within the island, but they're, they're, they're sovereign and, and independent communities that are there. The interesting thing is that Spanish officers like Armona, and again, you know, we have to take these sources with a grain of salt, but Spanish officers like Armona are, are saying things like, look, the, the, the insurgents are going to team up with the Maroons, to put it very, you know, grossly simplifi simplifying. But, um, and so there is a sense, there's a fear there that, that, that it is all one movement, in spite of the fact that, you know, we know that the Maroons are also, you know, engaging in their own struggles. They, and they do it in different ways in, in many instances, right? Like, for instance, there's this issue of uh, asylum, that, that perhaps, you know, runaway communities go to, towards the Spanish mountains um, of Bauruco and uh, they, you know, they create these communities, they ask for asylum, some of them maybe agree to certain, uh, uh, you know, stipulations with the Spanish, some of them agree to be converted to Christianity and they gain asylum and now they're part of these independent maroon communities. Um, but it's, it's, it, that's tough. I mean, it's, it's tough because one thing is what the leadership is saying, what they're deploying, the symbols that they're deploying, the images that, you know, they're utilizing. And another thing is what the masses are saying. Um, and I think that's a problem just, I mean, that, I think that's, that's something that it's just really hard to pinpoint um, in, in the broader history of, of revolutions. Um, I was going to say something else about that, but I'm, I'm blanking right now, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, thank, thanks for that. No, that's, that's very interesting. I, th I, know, um, I know that you've also worked as an asylum officer. Um, yes. And, um, and, and I, I'm interested, there's, there's a question from Omar Dio um, uh, that I think that I think will um, maybe maybe uh, link up to what you've just what you've just been saying as well um, as a way of thinking about how your um, your own scholarship in, has informed that work as a sign as a, an asylum officer and this is how do you compare the Haitian Revolution and the American Revolution and do you think if the Haitian Republic was recognized by um, by um, by England and America at that time, the situation of the contemporary ha of contemporary Haiti would be different now. I mean, thank you, uh, Omar. That's that's the, these these questions are so hard to, to 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 answer, right? I mean, I think in terms of comparing the revolutions, I mean, I think I I think everyone will at least everyone here <laughs> will, will agree or, or will acknowledge that, you know, that when we talk about true liberation, you know, uh, that Haiti is, is leagues above the American Revolution uh, in that sense. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of the internal processes, well, internal and external, are very similar, right? And so in the, in the same ways that we see, uh, you know, um, separatists, uh, colonists in the in the in the in, in the former British colonies trying to engage in a process of of separating not only separating from the crown but becoming independent right we're seeing a lot of that mirrored with the white colonists in Saint Domingue and in fact some of the um, you know I think this speaks to a really interesting question that was posed the other day by one of the professors uh, at Duke who, who asked me about the, the passport that says, I burn my nation, right? And the question was, the, the, my, whose nation is it, right? And so if these indeed are insurgents that are saying my nation, then what do we make of the fact that they're already talking about 
it in kind of nas- proto-nationalistic terms, right? And so the, I think the question of whose nation is this going to be is certainly similar in the, in the Haitian case. Uh, but of course, it, it, ra- it breaks radically with, with um, you know, with the American example uh, or with what I call the Usonian example. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like to use American there, but um, so that's on the one hand. Now, had, if Haiti had been recognized, would the situation been different? I mean, that is just, that is one of those questions that historians and scholars will for, for forever, you know, think about and argue. And, you know, I, I think Julia Gaffield's work here is very important because she does talk about how that notion that Haiti was completely isolated after the revolution is in some ways shrouded also in kind of myth right, that it actually wasn't that as, as, uh, as isolated as we tend to believe it was, and that in fact, some of the, like Dessalines was engaging in, in certain diplomatic uh, uh, correspondences with other states. I think, you know, what they did, however, in, in instituting a black, a black state, right, not, not immediately a black republic, but a black state, that is where, you know, at, at least my training cultural studies, uh, you know, really informs how I view it, right? They, they did not something, not just simply something unthinkable, but something that was literally, you know, literally and metaphorically destroying uh, that kind of white ideal, right? And so, but again, these are the paradoxes of revolutions, right? Is that while that on the one hand is, is something that I believe you know, to be true. On the other hand, like Jean Casimir's new book, which is, I encourage everyone, uh, one, of his, one of the things that his book argues is that they also appropriated this right to conquer, this right to be the new rulers, right? And so that, you know, I think it speaks to one of my underlying questions, which where do they find this right to be conquerors, to be rulers, to be strongmen, right? And, and to what extent does that inform the history of the Americas more broadly, you know, thinking specifically of caudillismo in, 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 in what we now know as Latin America, right? The, the figure of the strong man. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if, how the situation would have been different, but um, I suspect that had Haiti not only been recognized, but not been... Um, uh, castigated economically, particularly by France, right? The reparations that the Haitian state had to pay to France, uh, then perhaps things in the 20th century might have shaped out differently. But it's, it's always diff- it's always you know impossible to know. Thank you. Thanks. Um, there's a, a question from, uh, excuse me for my pronunciation, what now Ronilas, um, uh, who is uh, um, asking you again about um, symbols, sim- symbols from a religious perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and the question is, if you think about it, even now in Haiti, the Haitian mystery system is hidden behind Catholicism. Um, so I, th- I think that this is a question about symboliz- symbolism and syncretism, perhaps. Um, uh, and, um, and yeah, so, so if you could maybe just comment on that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that it, I, I think there's, there's a degree to which colonial terms um, or, uh, you know, terminologies that we use such as Catholicism or Christianity versus for instance, voodoo religion, uh, which is central to, to, to Haitian uh, culture uh, writ large. I think that sometimes they tend to trap us a little bit and burden us. Um, and so I think, um, I'm thinking for instance, that, you know, in those years, I think it, I think, various factions of the insurgency were comfortable utilizing both terms, right? Or, or engaging in both practices that they were not, and we know through the work of, of cultural historians that, they, that they're deeply intertwined, right? They're, 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 they're not mutually exclusive. And so I think 
it's, it's even, and even from the Catholic side, I think in those years, it probably wasn't uh, as big an issue as we might think, right? Um, that's, that's something that I think it's really important to kind of take into, into account. But I think it also speaks to a broader kind of transcultural political culture, right? And I, here I'm thinking, for instance, of Herman Bennett's work on liberal subjectivity um, and, and, and the kind of the role of, of Africa here and how, you know, the political is something that we tend to shy away from when thinking about cultural histories, right? So when we think about the history of, uh, you know, voodoo or, or, or something to that effect or, or dance in, in, in Afro-Brazil, whatever the case may be, we tend to, uh, and, and again, like historians have done great work and in, in infusing the two, but, you know, there has been a sense that the political or the, the, the political in the, in, in the African sense, right? Whether it was Congo or whether it was another kingdom or state uh, in West and Central Africa, that, that, that we don't take that seriously enough. And so I think that when we think of questions like, you know, Christianity versus voodoo and these kind of cultural, uh, transcultural processes, it's for me, what, what's really important is to, is to kind of try and flesh out what is, what is the political there? And again, that I, I've been, you know, I, through my various conversations, like I've, I've been convinced that not only is this a political history that I'm trying to tell, un, undergirded by cultural, legal, Atlantic histories, et cetera, uh, but that I should also put this project firmly rooted in black studies because black studies uh, in many ways, like we, we haven't seen a political history of, of royalism, you know, or of authoritarianism. And, and it's it, right, it, it often, you know, African and African descendant peoples of the Americas are again, like almost forced or injected into this Republican nation state project, right, where uh, I think it's very, it's much more complex than, than that. So Thanks. I mean, just just as a to add um, a comment from Raina Henderson, which I think speaks to to what you've just said too. Um, uh, she says the discussion of the unknown cross and Congo Christianity reminds me of Robert Farris's Farris Thompson's Flash of the Spirit and the mm -hmm. cosmogram Yoa that he describes as being prominent in Cuba and Afro-Cuban practices. Given Cuba's proximity to Haiti, maybe these things are connected. So I think. That, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And again, like this is why Ada Ferrer's work is so important because she really gives us that that foundation, right? To 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 intertwine. It reminds me of one of the questions that made my face get really hot <laughs> during my dissertation defense uh, from one of my uh, dear mentors. Um, who asked me if I was make if if this project if with this project I'm making a much larger claim about the history of Hispaniola and to that effect the history of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. right? And and at the time, you know, I think I think it it seeped into my work into the dissertation, but I hadn't explicitly thought about it and I hadn't explicitly kind of laid it out there to say yes I I am and now you know I think. I think we can, well, I'm going to try uh, with this book manuscript to say that, yes, that the, this is a much larger story that's happening here. It's not simply just the case of Haiti while, you know, uh, well, this is the story that I'm telling, but that it speaks to a much larger thing happening uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, and, you know, I think, yeah, I, 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 I can't speak to, to, to that directly, um, mm -hmm. the example in the question, but but certainly I think there's, there's, a, there's a sense of something, something antillano is, is, is happening here. And Marlena Dow, I mean, one of the foremost historians of, of this field, like she, she asked me once, like, is this a hemispheric story mm -hmm. that we're trying to tell, right? And, and I think that's one of the challenges is because I zoom in on the border so deeply and, and look at these kind of uh, trans, transcultural or transpolitical processes, you know, I think it, people might think that I'm steering away from the broader kind of Atlantic 
uh, uh, view of it, but I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. You know, I think it's a Caribbean story, but I also think it's a, it's a, a Black Atlantic story in many ways, as, as in, in the ways that Paul Gilroy taught us. <laughs> I think, you know, I'll just um, ask you one last question. I know we're, we're pretty much at time, but let me just, just put this question out there because it's, it's tightly related to what you, what you just said and maybe gives a way of thinking this through. Um, from Joseph Laos, um, thanks for an amazing talk. Does the centrality of monarchical thought to the Haitian revolution in your view change how we should understand the political meaning and popular reception of the abolition of slavery in 1793, 1794 in Saint-Domingue, which in the previous historic historiography have, has often been closely linked to Republican ideology. For example, okay, and I think that this is the more specific point um, to, to, go to, your, uh, to go to what you just said. Might we understand the popular project of emancipation as one of restoring good kingly government in place of a despotic plantation elite. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. Yes, uh, the short answer is yes. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it changes the way that we think of the, the sort of, again, the, the very neat nation state uh, teleological histories that were told within the rubric of, of Republican and liberal thought, because it forces us to really look at the ways in which uh, African and African descendants, uh, descendant peoples in the Americas, right, not just in Haiti, um, were already speaking a language that was not only political, but that was emancipatory, right? And they were utilizing that very same system to do it. And it, and, and, and it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, again, that I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, revive some sort of defunct ideology that, you know, that says that absolutism and authoritarianism is, is, you know, that we need to bring those things back. But it's simply to say that I think we've misread it. You know, I, I, I think it's, it not only have we misread it, but what it does is it, 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 it doesn't allow us to really delve into the complexity of black politics in this time, in this period, right? And I say that with big capital B and a big capital P, right? Like, and, and, and so these were projects that were already, you know, being talked about, you know, uh, whether it was in, uh, in the plantation or in, in the port towns or, you know, I mean, geez, Julia Scott's work, right? <laughs> the common wind, I mean, uh, which is foundational, I mean, this is, I think this is something that not only needs to be told, but we need to really understand that it, it, there are like, there, there are uh, massive repercussions for the way that we tell the, the political history um, of not just slave revolts and, and independence movements, but of, of black people in the Americas, right? And, and that we can't just simply categorize them in, within these, these boxes that the, that, the, that the very same colonial project that they're utilizing was also putting them in, right? Like this is, again, these are the, these are the paradoxes of revolution. And, and I think these are, you know, it, it, I think it's why in many ways it's an inconvenient history, you know, but um, as uh, uh, Sumathi told me the other day, you know, inconvenient histories are necessary, so. I will, I will, you know, <laughs> take her blessing and move forward with it. So thank you. Like a lovely, a lovely place to end with a question of inconvenient histories. Thank you so much, Jesus. Um, I think that the, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a really um, uh, fascinating morning with both the deep dive into the, into the archive, the implications of that archival work for our understanding of what constituted the political at the time, and also the larger historiographical questions um, and issues that you're drawing from, from, um, from your work. Um, so I want to thank you very much for your talk. Maybe thank we you. can all um, use the, part the reactions link to, uh, to just say um, congratulations, uh, thank you. Um, 
you know, if you've updated your Zoom, there are more possibilities than just the two that there once were. <laughs> I'm modeling that here. Um, and um, um, uh, thank, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming along this morning. Um, we hope to see you next Friday for another TGI FHI. Please go to our website, um, sign up and um, uh, thanks again, Jesus. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to everyone um, at FHI for, again, and at Duke for welcoming uh, me with open arms and allowing me to finally kind of try and, and make a little tiny splash. <laughs> for those people that didn't know <laughs> about my work, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.